or Jesus is the way. He can help you. He can, he can help you in this. So many times I've been negligent, just like Peter. And so I know what it feels like to be out in a boat, miserable, trying to carry on life that is normal or what used to be normal and go about it and find some kind of satisfaction in it. There is none. There is no satisfaction when we are apart from the Lord, when we deny Him access to our lives. There's no satisfaction. Go to John 21. Let's read about this. I could talk about it all day, but, but let's go there. And after these things, right at the beginning of verse 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back to try to find something to make a living, to make life happen. And they said to him, we're going with you also. (laughs) Hey, why not? Let's go fishing. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught, what do you think? What did they catch? Nothing. A whole lot of... A bunch of guys in a boat going, oh, what are we going to, oh, oh man, what are we going to do? Oh. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? <laughs> They were out all night, and they caught nothing. nothing. They had nothing to eat. They had caught nothing. They were pretty desperate. They were pretty sulking. They, of course, answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast. Now, I just have to think about the conversations that were either going on in their heads or among them, literally. Who is this guy? And why does he think there's going to be anything on? We're the fishermen. We know what's going on. Well, who is this guy to tell us to cast on the other side, the right side? But they did. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. And therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that was John, by the way, it is the Lord! It's the Lord! That's Jesus! Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it in the toiling and trying to catch fish all night. And he plunged into the sea. He plunged into the sea. Do we get what that's meaning? Do we get what that means? This man understood that that was Jesus. And he revealed again, once again, guys, you can't do this on your own. But if you follow after me, if you obey what I'm saying to you, you will be so full, you'll hardly be able to get that boat up to shore with all the fish. If you listen to what I'm saying, if you listen to what the Lord is saying, that's what I'm meaning in that. If you listen, if we obey, He will fill us. He will fill us up. And He will ignite in us passion. He will ignite passion in us and revelation. 
for John to say, hey, that's, that's the Lord. That was, that was the passion of revelation. And Peter, in that revelation, in the passion to be un united with the Lord, jumps out of the boat. You don't understand. Fishermen did not really get too wet while they were fishing. Fishermen did not have to because they had the means to stay dry. But Peter said, I am, I'm willing to be undignified. I'm willing to get wet. I am willing to go to the Lord. And that's exactly what he did. He jumped out and he went to the Lord. And this is where what I thought was the message was going to begin. You see, Jesus at that point reveals to Peter his love, his true love. The love that put him on a cross and the obedience that put him on a cross. I hear people saying, and it drives me nuts and I got to just say it. I hear people saying, well, Jesus hung on the cross because he loved us so much. Yes, that's true. But the reality that isn't spoken in that is that Jesus hung on the cross because he wanted to obey his Father. He wanted to obey his Father, not because he loved us so much. We're not that important. But the Father and obeying the Father, that is the key. And by the way, the Father loves us so much that because of what Jesus did on the cross and resurrection, guess what? Now we get to have life. But again, it's that life that says, I want to do, I want to be, I want to say, I want to hear and go what the Father says. That's what this is about. That's what it's about. And so often we find ourselves back in the boat going, well... I'm not sure. I'll just go fishing. God's saying, listen. Listen to me. I will restore you. I will bring you back because I have purpose. I have a plan. I have destiny. I have these things in store for you because you're my people. And I love you. And I want others to know of my love. Verse 15 in John 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because Jesus had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Bad time for the phone to ring. Assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird and carry you where you do not wish. And he spoke that signifying what death Peter would have to bring glory to God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. We're going to work through the questions first. And you're probably thinking they were the same question. <laughs> but reality here is, they were not the same questions. Jesus said to Simon, to Peter, to Simon, to Peter. Why did he call him Simon? 
son of Jonah. Well, because that was his name, right? When, when Peter came to be a disciple of Christ, his name was Simon, and he was the son of Jonah. And so there's a reality there. You see, Jesus said, I'm going to change your name. You're going to be Peter. And on this rock, I will what? Build my church, right? But guess what? He's no longer in that place of Peter. He's back to being called Simon, son of Jonah. Now, I'm not going to go into the implications of what all of that could mean. But what I want us to see is that there was separation going on here. It was no longer Peter. Peter, hey, buddy. It was Simon, son of Jonah. Do you love me? There was that brokenness that comes. And we have sensed it. I know this. We have felt that brokenness when we are absent, when we are disobedient. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than the other disciples? It doesn't, this isn't implying that Peter's love is a greater love. It's, it's implying that Jesus is saying, do you love me more than this situation, than these other men, the relationships that you have with them, your husband, your wife, your children? Do you love me more than these? Simon, do you love me more than that boat and the net and all those fish? Do you love me more than these? I don't want to put my list out there of what he, would, what he has pointed at and said, Mike, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than that thing? Do your children and your wife mean more than I do? And this is hardcore. This is gut-wrenching stuff. But this is where the Lord wants us to understand. He wants to be our first. He wants to be our core. He wants to be our life. And it's so easy. I will tell you right now, as Americans, it is so easy and I won't limit it to America, other places too, but it's so easy for us to look around and love these. Yes, yes it is. Amen. Now, I don't want to be a downer here and, and put pressure on you. I'll let the Holy Spirit do that. If you need it, He will do that. But what I want to say is, we are here to worship the Lord, yes. not these The second time, Jesus asks the same question, sort of. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? You see, in this, there is that purpose of reconciliation. There is, is that, that point where we get to a place because it's like, man, the first time I didn't catch that, but... The second time, ouch, that hit like a 20-pound hammer to the head. Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Because remember, you denied me. You disobeyed me. And it comes to that reality shock. <sighs> Lord, I failed you. The third time, Jesus says again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? <sighs> three times. Three times he asked me this. Three times I denied him. The overwhelmingness of the grief that Peter's heart was going through at that point, I can understand it. But the, the beauty in this, 
is that Jesus is asking him these questions because it's a process of reinstating him. It's a process of sanding down the paint and the varnish to get down to that pure wood. It's a process where Peter is broken, where he is completely surrendered because I, I, I can't do it. And Jesus is taking him through it. Not because he can, not because he wants to see Peter squirming, but because he loves him. And he knows that for the complete restoration to happen, it's a process and it's not a fun one. But it will help Peter. It will grow him and mature him into the, the man that God will use to be one of the leaders of the church to be the one that goes to the Gentiles and proclaims Jesus Christ as Savior, as Messiah, as the way and the truth and the life. You see, Peter needed that processing, as all of us need. We all need it. Yes. It's grace. It's forgiveness. It's the reality that Jesus has done what was needed to cover us, the mess. To cover us and to restore us into being fully made right. Hagoel. In the Hebrew, that means Jesus Redeemer. Hagoel. I'm probably saying it Wrong, but let's say it anyways. Hagoel. 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 Jesus, Redeemer. Do you, can you call him Hagoel this morning? Can you say, Lord, you have done the redeeming work in my life, in my heart, in my mind? Because we need to recognize the redemption and the restoration that God has done and continues to do in us. He is complete and he continues to make us able and right and restored. Turn with me to Matthew 16. Jesus came, in verse 13, into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? See, that's a question that we still have to, to let linger in our lives. Who do we say that Jesus is? Is he the guy that we come to see on Sunday mornings? Is he the leader of our lives? Is he the one that we love in a way that we go out on a limb even when we think it's going to break. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that was big, big, big. Yes. Okay? Because... None of them had that answer the first time that the question was asked. Peter wasn't sitting in the back, oh, like Abram would be. Oh, yeah, I know this one. I, I got it. I got it. Ooh, 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 pick me. Pick me. No. 
Peter was right there with the rest of them. Lord, people call you a lot of things. Some of them you don't want to hear. But guess what? In that moment, there was revelation. There was an understanding of who God was. You are the son of the living God. You are the Christ. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, which means a small rock. And on this foundation boulder, which was the revelation that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Church, we are still here today. We have been given the keys. We through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, are overcoming the enemy. Yes, yes, yes. And the gates of hell cannot stand against us. Yes. We need to get excited about this, not in a woohoo, but in a reality check. This is what Peter is restored for. This is what we are restored for. Church, we have been restored through the work of Jesus, through the love of God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been restored to go forth with the plan that has been there eternally and will reign for eternity. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound I'm sorry, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now listen, there's not going to be pink ponies running around. God's not talking about whatever you want, I'm the genie in the sky and I'm going to give it to you. He's saying, I have a plan and a purpose for you, bride, my church, my people. I have a purpose, but it's my purpose that will be done. It will be done through you when you obey me, when you believe me, when you come to me and receive from me. I will make you able to carry out my purpose. And what you ask for on earth will be bound up in heaven. And what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have such, such a great trust from God. We have such a plan that he wants to do in us and through us. You see, we are represented in this story with Peter and Jesus. Just as we can connect to the brokenness that Peter felt in denying Jesus and being disobedient, we can also be overjoyed and overwhelmed with the, the greatness of what it is to be restored through Jesus. We are the ones that God is wanting to use to feed his sheep, to tend the sheep, to feed the sheep. But it is the power of God that brings true care and adequate nourishment. You see, I will tell you right now, none of us can do what God is calling us to do apart from God. If we are not vested in the Lord, if we are not committed to Him, if we are not seeking after Him, we aren't ready. We aren't able. We will fail. But listen to this. We have been given the gifts of God to carry out his plan. He's saying, listen to me, guys. 
follow me and I'll give you what you need. When the time comes, you open your mouth. And through the Holy Spirit, I will put words there for you to speak. When the time comes, you give away what you thought was your last piece. And guess what? The basket, when you reach back at it, will be full. It is amazing what God has in store for us. But let me tell you, it has nothing to do with what this world would go about doing it like. That didn't make a whole lot of sense. It has nothing to do with the way that we would go about doing it in our flesh. Absolutely nothing. And this is why the Lord is saying, surrender yourself to me. Be broken so that I can put you back together. Let your heart be pliable because I have things that, that in your fleshly heart, you won't be able. You won't even get it. You won't understand. But if you listen to me, I will make you able. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I believe that each person here this morning, when you received Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as King of your life, the Lord bloomed gifts in you. And the Holy Spirit wants to guide and counsel us into how to use the gifts that have been put in us. To be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Do you understand the gifts that God gives us? is the manifold grace of God. It is by His grace that we are made able to serve Him. It's by His grace that we can carry out that service to Him. And it's through the gifts that He has imparted to us. The abilities that we have to go about showing the world who He is and each other. Romans 12 Verse 3, just listen to it. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Listen to these gifts. If prophecy, let us prophesy in portion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, and that's not only me, just throw that in there. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You see, we have been gifted. We have been given what we need to carry out the plan that God has. We, the church, have been restored with a purpose. We have been restored so that we can carry out and serve God's kingdom and God's ways. This has been going on since the beginning. You can flip back to Genesis 2 and you will see when God created Adam and put him in the garden, what was he told? What was his job? What was he given to do in the garden? To tend it and to keep it. You see, since the beginning, from man number one, God has determined that he would use us to tend and to keep, to feed, to tend, to feed, to tend, to feed, to care. Not only for each other, but for all that he loves. You see, the young... They need the milk, the understanding love of God. 
All the sheep need cared for. The individual sheep as well as the flock. And all the sheep that are mature need meat. We need to grow in the word of God. Not just hearing it, not just getting it, another teaching under our belt. No, the word of God so that it can be applied to our lives and walked out. Applied to our lives so that we know how to care better. So that in the gifts that we have in the Holy Spirit, that we can use those under his guidance. That is why he has restored us. That is why he has called us his people. That is why he is working in us on a daily basis. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is our Redeemer. Hagoel. Hagoel. Jesus, the Redeemer. He has restored us, and he has called us, and he has purposed in us to be his people to reveal his love, to shine his light. We are his people, church. We are his. Let's stand up. As you go into this day today or into this week, I'm asking that you would look for those that God places in your path to tend to and to care for. And maybe that's you in the mirror. Maybe that's you tomorrow or this, this evening looking in the mirror going, Whew, I feel like Peter out there in that boat, alone, overwhelmed. Turn to him. Turn to him. Bow your head to him. Give him your heart. And let him restore you. Lord Jesus, we ask right now that you would make us your people, the church. You have called us, Lord. We are yours. Make us alert. Make us awake, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would minister to our hearts the gifts that you have placed in us, that you would, that you would use us. But Lord, we ask first and foremost that you would help us to be restored unto you that you would help us to see areas where, where we are not ready, that you can restore and make us ready, where you can bring life where death wants to try and live. Father, we thank you that you have given us the way. And when we give you our focus, when we give you our lives, when we give you our families and we give you our possessions, that you will carry us forward. You will take us to the place that you have for us to go. And when we get there, we will be ready because you are with us. Lord, we thank you for this, this story, this, this reality of who Peter was. We thank you, Lord, for the reality of who you are, Jesus, that you restore us and you bring us to a place of being usable in your kingdom. Father, help us to take the process. Help us to take the steps. Lord, help us to be willing servants, 